Our reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 12. If you'll stand with me as I read the passage from God's Word this morning. John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16, says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much again for this time that we've had this morning to look into your word. And we thank you for the occasion of today, the the revelation of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we just thank you so much for all the love that you have showered upon us, the love that has provided the way for our salvation. May we begin this morning to meditate upon that for this entire week. It is in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we ask this prayer. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. you be turning to Luke 19 as well. There was a little boy who missed church because he was sick one morning. His mom stayed home with him, but his dad went on to church. And then his dad came home from church with a little palm branch. And uh, he gave it to the little boy when he got home. And uh, the boy said, what is this? And his dad said, well, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him, and they laid him down in his path. So we had palm branches at church today, and I brought one home for you. And the little boy said, wouldn't you know it, the one Sunday I miss church and Jesus comes. <laughs> the passage I read from John uh, is often called the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. As he crossed over the Mount of Olives, he made his way through the East Gate and into the temple on that day. And so this day is also sometimes referred to as the Day of Visitation. The crowd accompanying him, uh, waving palm branches and laying down clothes in, their path, in his path as well. All four Gospels record this event, which tells us how important it is. Luke is the only one who speaks of the clothes or the outer garments also being laid in the path, as we'll see this morning. Matthew and Mark make reference to tree branches being laid down in his path, but um, it's uh, only John is the one who specifically names them as palm branches, and because of that, it's for this reason that this Sunday before Resurrection Sunday is known as Palm Sunday. If you were a believer of Jesus Christ when all of this was happening, then you would have really felt like, you know, this show was about to finally start to get on the road here. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ had been in public ministry for three and a half years, but there didn't really seem to be any kind of a revolution starting to take place. There were many people who wanted to put Jesus to the forefront and uh, get behind him in a revolution, but uh, it, it wasn't happening. But now we have this. And so uh, the crowds are all around Jesus, and they're expecting him to, to do this now. And so they're responding to that with this celebration and this acknowledgement uh, that normally would be reserved for kings. Jesus had been on the way to the Jerusalem for weeks now, teaching along the way, and he arrives at just the right time, uh, the very day that the Passover celebration began. And you say, well, uh, Passover is later in the week, right? Yes, we'll get there in a moment, but this was the start of the Passover celebration. So you can imagine that now in Jerusalem, I mean, the, the place is packed. There's people and animals everywhere. There would have been uh, a noise from the crowd that would have been much larger, much louder than what would be normal. And, you know, like I say, a lot of people, a sea of humanity. A lot of people would have crowded into small areas in and around Jerusalem and probably would have been uncomfortable. Uh, you would have had to wait in long lines everywhere you went and probably some things got a little more expensive because there'd be a little bit of price gouging because you have a captive audience now. Um, almost like going to Six Flags on a discount ticket Sunday or Saturday, excuse me. 
the Jewish calendar had several feast days on it. And after the feast of the Passover uh, was one of the, uh, excuse me, and the feast of the Passover was one of the most important festivals of the year. It was a celebration of freedom. It was a celebration of salvation because it was to commemorate their being led out of bondage from the land of Egypt. It was uh, them being provided salvation directly by the hand of God when that happened, when they were led out of that bondage. The last plague of that ordeal in Egypt, you may recall, was the death of the firstborn. But God had instructed the Hebrews to take a lamb, a perfect spotless lamb, and kill it, sacrifice it, and then put that blood over the doorpost and on the sides of the door to the entry to their home. And that blood then would protect those families. And the avenging angel of death would then pass over those homes that were covered by the blood. And so that's where we get the name Passover for this celebration. When this original judgment happened, the very next day, the Hebrew people were set free. They commemorated that event year after year after that. A pure and spotless, perfect lamb would be chosen and sacrificed, and they would continue to put that blood of the lamb on the sides of the doorpost and over the doorway. Um, and then on Friday, that lamb would be killed, that Passover lamb. But you see, this day, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, is the day that that lamb would be chosen. And then the lamb would be offered, would be sacrificed on that Friday. And a feast would follow to remember God's salvation. But Jesus Christ presented himself as the Lamb of God when he rode into Jerusalem on this day. And what they were to do when they chose this lamb was to set it aside and observe it to make sure that there was no spot or blemish or anything unhealthy about that lamb before they sacrificed it on that Friday. Jesus presented himself to be examined by the people all throughout this week to know that there was no spot or blemish found in him. And then we know how it will turn out. He is the lamb of God who will be sacrificed on that Friday, delivering the nation once again, but this time from their sin. We'll talk more about the crucifixion and resurrection next Sunday, but today let's look at the events that transpired here. What's uh, referred to as the triumphal entry, or as I said, the day of visitation. We're going to be looking at the passage from Luke 19 this morning. And first of all, we see the preparation for the event. Luke 19, let's read verses 29, 30, and 31. It says, And it came to pass, when he, that is Jesus, drew near Bethany and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where you enter, uh, where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say, shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. He and his disciples were still a few miles away from Jerusalem at this point when their journey began early that morning. And Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead to find a young colt that no one had ever ridden on before. And the record we read a moment ago from John in John chapter 12 and verse 16, it tells us there that the disciples didn't understand what they were doing. The disciples didn't know what was happening at this time. So to them, again, this also must have seemed really strange. In Jesus' earthly ministry, you know, it never records that he rode on anything. It appears that Jesus walked everywhere he went during his entirely earthly ministry. Um, he rode on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, uh, also walked there once, but that's not the subject of study this morning. He walked everywhere. So I think his disciples might have wondered why suddenly on this morning did they have to go and get a donkey, a young colt for him to ride. Uh, so they're to go into town and just take a colt? Just go into town and find one and bring it here. You'll find a young colt that no one's ever ridden before. Uh, that would have been uncommon too, to just go and take somebody's donkey 
do you find? And thievery wasn't uh, very well accepted. And you can imagine that they'd be on the lookout for it right now with all of these people around. I mean, picture the equivalent of this. I've used this illustration before. I kind of like it, though. If I were to tell you, go into town to the local dealership and, you know, find a brand new 4x4 there, pick up that nobody's ever driven before, and uh, keys are going to be in the ignition, and just, you know, get that thing and bring it to me. And if the dealer asks, uh, what are you doing? Just say, you know, ah, the, the, the preacher needs it. See how well that turns out. <laughs> how did it turn out here, though? Of course, exactly as the Lord said. Verses 32 through 35, let's read Luke 19. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him. So they followed through with what the Lord had asked them to do, exactly as he had asked them to do it, and it worked out exactly as the Lord said it would. We shouldn't be so shocked by that. It's a lesson for our own lives here as well. When they were confronted, they didn't uh, run away. They didn't back down. Uh, they did exactly what the Lord had told them to do. They put their trust in the Lord, you see. Sometimes we get timid and fearful in following the Lord. Sometimes we have fear. Sometimes we have doubt that stops us from taking the action that we are called to take as believers. But we are to continue to stand bold for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not rude, not rude, but bold, you see. Steadfast, unstoppable in our walk with the Lord and what we have been commanded to do. So in this case, why a donkey? Why did they have to go get a donkey? Because the local rent beast was out of camels? Because everybody, everybody was there? No, we know exactly why a donkey is what had to be chosen because this was the fulfillment of prophecy. John pointed out in the passage that we read in John chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, that this was fulfillment of prophecy and quoted the passage from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Matthew does the same in chapter 21 and verse 5. That prophecy was given about 520 years prior to this event taking place. Even more striking was that when Zechariah wrote that prophecy, Jerusalem was in ruins. You recall the Babylonians had sacked Jerusalem, destroyed it years before that, and uh, the restoration of Jerusalem had only barely begun at the time that Zechariah writes this. So for the most part, Jerusalem is still deserted and destroyed and desolate. It's only a few there. But Zechariah spoke of a day when Jerusalem would be restored and be a thriving city once more. And in fact, the Messiah would ride into that city on a donkey. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. So then Jesus rides this unbroken beast into the city in the midst of a throng of people moving and shouting all around him. And the colt doesn't try to buck Jesus off. I mean, picture that. That in itself is a miracle. But Jesus, in doing so, was fulfilling one of the prophecies that was written about him. But consider this. This is just the start of the fulfillment of many other prophecies that are going to be fulfilled during this Passion Week. And prior to this, Jesus Christ had already fulfilled many other prophecies. With every fulfilled prophecy, it just proves that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, the Son of God, the Messiah who had come to redeem Israel. As Jesus rides into town on the donkey, we see the reaction of the people as well. Look at verse 36. Luke 19, verse 36. As he went, many spread their clothes on the road. 
not all their clothes. Uh, and speaking of an outer garment, uh, it would be kind of like uh, if I saw Jesus coming down the aisle here and I take off this jacket, you see, outer garment, and I lay it down in front of Jesus as he comes. We know that there were these outer garments and also, as we mentioned already, palm tree branches, as we saw from the record in John chapter 12. Why? Why do this? Um, the laying down of the outer garment would be akin to our red carpet treatment today. You know, you roll out the red carpet for dignitaries or celebrities that are coming. That would be what these outer garments would kind of symbolize in our society today. And the palm tree branches were a traditional symbol of victory. So they were expecting Jesus Christ, as he's coming into town, to be their Messiah to be that conquering king that would give them victory. And so that's why these palm branches were laid down. As Jesus rode into the city, you can imagine the multitude of people that were around him, people of all different backgrounds, gathered together around for different reasons. Some of them were his followers, of course. The 12 were there. But Jesus had more disciples than just the 12. You understand that, right? Jesus had quite a following of disciples. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and ascension of Jesus Christ, we find that there's still, even at that time, 120 followers of Jesus Christ who are gathered together in what's called an upper room there. But at this time, I would think it would probably be more than that. I would think the, the crucifixion and the persecution that happened surrounding that uh, and the fear that they would be next would have kept many people away. So I can imagine that the actual disciples of Jesus Christ wasn't just 12, uh, nor was it 120. I would think there were probably more than that at this time that were following him. But they weren't all followers. Some were enemies. We'll see that the Pharisees were there as well. It seems that the enemies of Christ are never too far away, are they? The Pharisees were some of the most ardent enemies of our Savior. Throughout his ministry, they were hot on his heels to try to get him to trip up in some way, uh, find any means, uh, any accusation that they could to use against him to put him to death. And so they are here as well. And then you have a whole lot of skeptics. Followers you have, enemies you have, and then those people that, ah, eh, they're just kind of in between, you see. They're just showing up just to see what's going to happen. Not a believer, not a persecutor, not convinced yet that Jesus was who he said he was. Kind of a lot of people that had to wait and see which side we want to be on for this. But you can imagine being Jews of the nation of Israel, if this is somebody who can come in and throw off the Gentile dominion over us to help us conquer Rome, then yeah, we'll get behind that, even if it's only a, a fickle nature at this point, even if it's only for the moment. So you can imagine that a large portion of the crowd who were skeptics or you know not really on either side would have joined into this celebration and would have started shouting along with the crowd we find that uh, they do indeed start to shout praises we'll look at verse 37 psalm chapter 19 and verse 37 and 38 then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So the procession makes its way now through these little villages and comes to the leg of the trip where they're about to enter into Jerusalem already a lot of people when this began, but can you imagine as this fervor nears Jerusalem coming from the Mount of Olives just on the east side, that more people would start to come out to see what's going on and join this throng and join in the celebration. As this parade proceeds, more and more people join this excitement, you see. I just want you to get this picture as the group continues to grow and they escort Jesus from the Mount of Olives 
down into the town there of Jerusalem. First of all, we see that they praise him for what he did. Look at verse 37 again. It says, as they drew near, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. The disciples are the ones who started this shouting and this singing of praises to him. Um, and they did it because all of the things that they had seen him do, it says. All the mighty works, all the miracles that he had performed. And so now as he starts to ride in Jerusalem, and they're thinking he's now going to announce himself as the king to help overthrow Rome, then they start shouting and singing these praises because they praised him for who he was. Look at verse 38 again, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. John chapter 12 and verse 13 says that they also shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. Matthew records that they also shouted, Hosanna, the son of David. Um, Hosanna is a title for a savior. Uh, Hosanna literally means save us. And so they're shouting out for him to save us. They're shouting out for him to be their savior. They were ready to celebrate this new king who would deliver them. Finally, their Messiah had come. What they were looking for in the Messiah was a conquering king, a redeemer nationally, you see. All of this excitement, all of this fervor, all of this shouting, all of this attention on Jesus. And consider this, he accepts it. He accepted it. The man who healed a leper in Matthew chapter 8 and said, tell no one. The man who healed two blind men in Matthew chapter 9 and said, tell no one. The man who raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead in Mark chapter 5 and said, tell no one. In Mark chapter 1, while casting out demons, the demon addressed Jesus and said, I know who you are, Holy One of God. But the Lord Jesus Christ pretty much told the demon to shut up. Over and over again, Jesus Christ chose not to draw attention to himself. At times, he would completely leave an area just so he could shake the crowds, just to leave the crowds behind, to avoid attention. But on this day, all of that changed. Jesus did not stop them. Jesus did not tell them to be quiet. It was a completely different approach than what he had done before when he was trying to remain under the radar, you see. When he'd say, tell no one, and he would slip out. Today, he accepts the praise. Why? Because it's time to proclaim who he is. Look at verses 39 and 40. It says, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. If the people don't lift up their voices, then the rocks will cry out. It was time to acknowledge who he truly was. It was time to publicly proclaim him as the Son of God. It was time to accept him as the Messiah, the King, the one who would save them. Hosanna, Savior. If the people didn't do it, then Jesus Christ as the Creator would give the rock's voice to do it. It was a great celebration, but the Lord knew that this celebration was going to be short-lived. Look at verses 41 through 44. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, 
saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come unto you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, close you in on every side, and level you, and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The people shouted praises, but they didn't really know what was going to happen. The people had expectations, but what's going to happen at the end of this week is not what they expected. John the Baptist had come to prepare the way. The Lord had come to them. He had revealed himself. He had manifested his presence among them, and they had beheld his glory, but they would not accept him as the Son of God. As John says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. There was laughter, there was praise, there was joyous shouting all around him, but Jesus knew that this was only a superficial fervor that was taking place. He knew what was ahead in the coming days as God's perfect Passover lamb. He knew what awaited him. I'm sure there were people in this crowd who on this Sunday were shouting praises that come Friday will be in that crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. While joy prevailed all around him, Jesus wept, it says. He was often moved with compassion during his earthly ministry. Only one other time, though, do we find in the scriptures that's recorded that he wept, which was, of course, just a few short weeks prior to this, when he came to Bethany to resurrect Jesus, uh, excuse me, resurrect Lazarus from the dead. There he was filled with sorrow and despair because of the havoc that sin causes in the human existence. Here, it's because of the judgment that awaits the city because of their rejection of him. They had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they wouldn't listen. They missed the whole point of his message to them, which, yes, was in fact symbolized by those palm branches that they were laying down. Remember what the palm branches symbolize? Victory. Victory. And he was about to provide them victory over sin. Victory over sin. When the Maccabees overthrew the Syrian oppressors and reestablished worship in the temple in Jerusalem, this was what the Jews had done as the, uh, the Maccabees rode into the town after it was delivered. So following the same action shows that they expected Jesus to give them victory in that sense in the sense of being a warrior king who would overthrow these Gentile oppressors. And they were ready to pick up swords and get behind him and go to war with the Romans. But unfortunately, they were not ready to battle the problem of their own sinfulness. And that reluctance and ignorance would end up costing them dearly. Not many years after this, Rome is going to overturn this entire city. The temple will be completely destroyed. Not one stone left upon another. This isn't the first time that Jesus had said that. And why did that happen? Why, when the Romans came in and overthrew the city, why did they tear it down so much that there was not one stone left upon another? I've told you before, maybe many of you remember. It's because there was so much gold in the temple. And when the Romans came in and they burned the city, they were given specific instructions, believe it or not, not to burn the temple. Why? Because of all the treasures that were in the temple and the gold. 
But something happened, and the temple caught on fire anyway. And all of that gold in the temple melted. It melted down into the stone. And so in order to retrieve all of that gold, the Romans, after they had run everybody out of the city, went into the city and took it apart stone by stone to get every last little bit of gold out of that city. And thus was fulfilled the prophecy that not one stone would be left upon another. Jesus knew all of this. Amid all of the celebration and the shouting and this fanfare, Jesus knew what was coming. And so he wept for them. They had eyes, but they didn't see. Jesus, the Savior, their Messiah, was riding into their city on a donkey. Another thing is a conquering king, when he rode into a city, he would ride in on a stallion to commemorate his military might. But a king wanted to, wanting to arrive in peace wouldn't ride in on a stallion. He would ride in on a donkey, which is what Jesus Christ did on this day. Demonstrating peace, the peace that he would bring. Oh, the stallion's coming. That's in Revelation 19, if you'd like to go read there on his second coming when he returned. Jesus wasn't the only one who had arrived in Jerusalem for the Passover. Pontius Pilate had also arrived and was ready. Why? Because during this time, it wasn't unusual for the Jews when they were finally all gathered together once again for this Passover celebration in Jerusalem for them to decide that you know they might want to kick up their heels a bit in uh, rebellion against the Romans and poke them just a little and prod them just to see if they were still as strong and mighty as they claimed to be. So Pontius Pilate had arrived with a full complement of battle-hardened Roman soldiers to keep the peace. Herod Antipas was also here. He had tried to meet Jesus before, had tried to send out people to find him and bring him before him. And not long ago, he is also the one who had beheaded John the Baptist. Oh, he's here, ready to meet Jesus, wanting to. So the stage was set for the mock trial and the crucifixion that would occur later in the week. And Jesus knew everything that awaited him and them as he rode into the city. And where does he go? Verse 45. John chapter 19. I'm just going to read the first part of verse 45. It says, Then he went into the temple. He went into the temple. Here's a bit of Jewish tradition for you, if you didn't know it. During the time of the Passover, the east gate was made sure to remain open. And the temple doors would be made sure to remain wide open. Not for the sake of all the crowds that were coming, but in case the Messiah arrived, just as the Old Testament foretold, just as the prophets of old had said, that he would come in through the east gate off the Mount of Olives and go into the temple. So they'd leave the gate open and they'd leave the doors open, ready to receive the Messiah and enthrone him. And guess what? He arrived. Just as the scriptures foretold that he would. Riding on a donkey just as Zechariah had said. At the very time that Daniel said it would occur in his vision of 70 weeks. But they did not know the time of their visitation. And so Jesus wept. The Sunday that the Lord came to church and they totally missed it. We have the privilege of hindsight. We're able to see what the people of that time did not and understand that things that even the disciples could not, as the scriptures 
told us. As we enter into this holy week between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, let us allow the Lord to enter our heart and to reign in our heart. Enter, I say, if you are still an unbeliever, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and what he did for our salvation and dying on the cross of Calvary for our sins and shedding his own blood, God's own blood, as payment for our sins. Let him enter, accept him as your Savior and know that his resurrection three days later, one week from now, we commemorate Resurrection Sunday is proof that God is satisfied with the payment that he made fully on behalf of our sins. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then truly let him reign in your life. Serve him. Yield to the power of the Holy Spirit in your life because of what he has done for us. To experience the miracle of redemption and freedom and bondage from our sin nature is something that we should rejoice about, that we should sing praises about, experiencing restoration and healing and true life. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we've had to look into your word once again this morning. And we thank you and praise you for the plan of salvation that was laid out and for our Savior for following it through. As we enter into this week, Father, once again, I pray that the meaning of this week really does affect us, that it really does have an impact upon us. We know, Father, that you are the one who have given us our emotions and we just pray that this is the kind of event that does indeed affect us emotionally. We thank you and praise you, Father, for your great and awesome love and mercy and your wondrous, matchless grace on our behalf. Before we close, Father, we offer an invitation once more for those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior that they would do so right now, this day, this moment, because we know, Father, we are not guaranteed another day. We are not guaranteed even the rest of this day. May we secure, each one of us, our eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior, right now. Father, for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we thank you and praise you for it, and again, plead with each and every one who have that it would make a difference that it would show in their daily life. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we ask this prayer. Amen.